Fabrizio, uh, welcome, warm greetings from Geneva. Happy New Year to you. Uh, and you have the floor. And thank you for your patience. Oh, thank you, uh, Stefan, and, and very warm greetings and a, and a very happy new year to, to you and to, to, to all uh, who are participating uh, here. Uh, so, as Steph mentioned, we issued today the final report of what was a, a, a complete, unique, and unprecedented initiative uh, by the United Nations. And that was a global reality check, uh, a global effort to capture what is the sort of world that people, people want across generations, across all regions, 25 years from now. What do they see as the biggest threats uh, to that world? What are their expectations of international cooperation in addressing any gap between the world they aspire to and the world they think we may get? And we also asked, um, and this was the first time those questions have been asked, what people see as their immediate priorities for post-COVID uh, uh, um, reconstruction, recovery, and how they see the role of international cooperation against the backdrop, particularly of uh, COVID. We uh, gathered... Um, input from across the world through multiple data sources. And just to recall the major five, one, we did direct uh, surveying of, uh, at the end, it came to about 1.5 million people in all 195 uh, countries. Secondly, we staged a much more elaborate, in-depth, so-called UN75 uh, conversations and we had those in about 100 countries embracing hundreds of thousands of people um, uh, in, uh, and, and got detailed feedback from those. Thirdly, in order to have a scientific reality check uh, for our own initiatives, we commissioned um, two of the most renowned um, uh, pro survey professionals Edelman and uh, the Pew Research Center to do independent, fully scientific um, surveys in 50 representative countries that went into a little more depth, but along the same uh, questions, in order to cross-check what we did through our direct survey and ensure um, that it that it um, shined uh, and was coherent with with a much more scientific. Uh, methodology by, by the professionals. Um, fourthly, we undertook uh, innovative AI analysis of social and traditional media in 70 countries to get a, a same sense through that AI analysis sentiment around the same questions. And finally, we reached out to hundreds of universities and think tanks across the world to get their responses to the, to the same questions. Um, what is most striking and this, particularly against the backdrop, which was evident, incidentally, in many of the questions you're asking, um, what was most striking is that against a backdrop of disunity, fragmentation, friction, uh, conflict, disagreement that so characterizes uh, business within and between states today, and that we feel particularly acutely uh, in New York against the backdrop of, of the disagreements that, that often hold the Security Council paralyzed and often uh, make the, the general progress in the General Assembly difficult uh, at best against that backdrop. When you ask people about their fears and hopes for the future, when you ask that people about their expectations of international cooperation, about their priorities in the immediate term post-COVID, there is remarkable unity across generations and remarkable unity across generations regions, income groups, education groups, and against uh, political people from different political um, directions. When, more specifically, um, in terms of the immediate priorities post-COVID, the world is largely united around calling for better access, more affordable access to fundamental um, uh, basic services, affordable health care, uh, quality uh, education and water uh, and sanitation. 
And there's a second major concern with uh, the need for greater solidarity to the hardest hit countries and the hardest hit um, uh, communities. And related to that, a demand for an adjustment to our economic model to make it more inclusive and less uh, furthering of gross inequalities that have become more apparent and exacerbated by COVID. And those are pretty universal. When it comes to longer term concerns, in the, in the majority of regions, the chief concern is destruction to our environment uh, and climate change. And that is, that is not limited to a certain age group, nor limited to a certain uh, political direction. It is pretty universal. Um, and the second uh, set of concerns relate to uh, upholding of, better upholding of human rights, um, reduction of conflict, conflict understood not just as conflict between states or within states, but also understood increasingly as uh, political violence, violence uh, against women, and also, um, and I'll come back to that, concerns with inequality, uh, poverty, and related to that, corruption. Corruption came across uh, globally as a, as a major concern in many uh, places. With regard to international co cooperation, there is overwhelming support for increased international cooperation. No less than 97% of people see international cooperation as important for tackling today's problems, and the vast majority see it as more than important, as absolutely uh, essential. Um, but, you know, we would be mistaken in the UN to take that with any degree of complacency or as a pat on the back. While there is recognition of the UN's contribution, while the UN is seen as even more important moving forward, people are also looking for an upgraded UN, an improved UN, a UN that is more inclusive of today's stakeholders, a UN that is more accountable uh, and more um, effective, and better stands up uh, for principles and for its uh, values. Now, um, I have stressed what was brought out, which is largely held in common. But I think what is interesting and what you will find in some detail in this report is the nuances, the nuances between regions, the nuances between age groups, and the nuances uh, between timelines, because it's quite striking. You know, we started this survey work uh, in January. As you'll recall, COVID hit in March, April. So we can trace differences between responses before COVID had hit with full vigor and after COVID hit with full vigor. And there are some very striking things in that regard, some self-evident, not, others not so self-evident. First, COVID has only made people think international cooperation is more important, more important than ever. The number of people supporting and seeing international cooperation as essential grew, did not diminish with COVID. So you have this paradox that while people were isolated in their homes, less connected, less able to travel, more quarantined, borders more marked than ever before, an awareness of our global interconnectivity, our awareness of our global um, interdependence actually grew. Uh, and that came out quite strongly. Secondly, the whole importance and concerns around employment opportunities. That will, did not feature very highly uh, in the first few months, and progressively it mounted as a priority for respondents who responded later uh, in the year. And, and that's obviously uh, to be expected against the backdrop of record uh, unemployment let, uh, 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 levels uh, with uh, COVID. Uh, other uh, regional differences worth noting are um, the calls for more solidarity, more help to the hardest hit countries. Especially in middle income and low income countries, there are strong calls for greater solidarity with hardest hit communities and hardest hit countries. Less so in the most developed countries. But having said that, in the most developed countries, there are more calls for adjustments to our economic model to make it more inclusive. So if you like, the same concern around inequality, 
is being looked at in, through two different lenses. One, in the most developed countries, through a need for an adjustment to our economic models to, to make them more inclusive and, and better able to help those who have been disproportionately affected by COVID, who were already disproportionately affected prior to COVID uh, by poverty and marginalization, and in middle in and lower incomes by calls for greater um, solidarity. I think also striking was that um, the calls for um, uh, uh, the, 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 the emphasis on the importance of global cooperation, as I said, was pretty universal. But the areas where it was actually highest, where, where the, the, the number of respondents or the proportion of respondents saying not just that it was important, but that it was essential, um, was highest in North America. Uh, followed by Latin America and uh, Europe. Um, when it comes to uh, climate uh, change, um, there, there, there was, in all but one region, it was seen as the highest uh, priority, uh, and it was rated, rated by the, the largest majority of people as the highest priority in Latin um, America and the Caribbean, which, against the backdrop of deforestation, um, and uh, uh, um, uh, record uh, hurricane season is not so surprising. But it was also equally very high in Oceania, um, North America, Europe, uh, Eastern and Southeastern um, Asia. You know, one of the findings that is perhaps counterintuitive, and you may indeed have asked me for the reasons behind it, and I will only be able to speculate uh, because um, I'm, I'm really not sure, is that when were people were asked about what sort of future um, do you expect the future to be better 25 years from now from the one you've enjoyed, um, the world to be in a better place than the world is today, um, the, the optimism is strongest in the poorest countries and in countries hardest hit by conflict. So paradoxically, where the current situation is most acute and most difficult, levels of optimism about the future are highest. And in countries, the, high, uh, the, the countries on, ranked highly on the Human Development Index, levels of optimism uh, about the future um, are, are, are lowest. It's also striking that engagement with international cooperation uh, and support for it, although universal, is particularly high among youth. I think youth understand better than many of the older generation that inevitably, in an interconnected, interdependent world, one cannot uh, not be a global citizen as well as a patriot or a nationalist in this or that country, uh, that all our lives uh, are interconnected. I think there's a very high level of awareness among youth across the world. Women tend to favor international cooperation uh, more than men. But having said that, men tend to be slightly more optimistic um, than um, uh, women. So those are some of the, 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 the findings. You'll find much richer detail in this report. We also um, today um, have set up um, or, or uh, put out a, a data portal where we have all our findings in endless detail, where you will find the full Edelman and Pew surveys, you will find country breakdowns for everything I've, I've, I've listed, you will find all the materials we produced uh, throughout the year. And that data portal will be, will be our legacy and will be available for the public at large, for academics, for NGOs, for every, anybody who's interested in this incredible rich data uh, we've gathered um, over, over this past year through, through 60,000 partners across the world, through, our, uh, through member states, obviously, through, through our own uh, uh, offices. Um, the, in terms of, you know, what is the follow-up? What next? As you're aware, the, the, the member states negotiated and, and heads of state agreed on the 21st of September to a UN 75 declaration. We fed into that declaration. We, we published in April um, uh, uh, our preliminary findings, which 
which uh, member states were gracious enough to take into account in the wording of that declaration, in the identification of priorities and commitments. As you're aware, the Secretary General was also tasked in that resolution, in that um, uh, declaration, to come back um, with uh, a comprehensive set of proposals of how to upgrade, reimagine, reinvigorate multilateralism, both to better address uh, people's concerns um, today, as well as their aspirations uh, for, for tomorrow. And we, in recent weeks, have been feeding in with much more granular, detailed findings into the team that's, that's undertaking that exercise for the uh, Secretary General. And needless to say, uh, all our findings are, are, are at their disposal. So the Secretary General will be coming back with very concrete recommendations, building on much of what we found out. But of course, and this is more of a personal observation, I know in many areas, we already know the solutions. I mean, when it comes to climate change, the solutions are out there. It's more a question of having the political will to bring about um, those uh, solutions. And we hope that uh, by highlighting of global common concerns in a manner that makes it very clear that these are not concerns of some removed, remote uh, a group of international bureaucrats sitting in a blue bubble um, on, on the banks of the, the, the East River. But these um, are, are areas that are at the heart of people's fundamental concerns across the world, that uh, bringing that to the fore will ha also help contribute to building um, the sort of political will that is a prerequisite uh, to, to taking the tough choices uh, around the sorts of changes um, that, that are required to build the more sustainable, more inclusive um, uh, uh, future that so many across the world very clearly um, aspire to. Um, it was mentioned um, by Steph that there will be this event uh, in London, which for us will be a, a sort of concluding event. Um, and the Secretary General will make reference there to our, to our findings in, um, in his speech. Um, the, the, the event will take place in Westminster Hall, which is, is very significant for a number of reasons. It was, it's very symbolic. It was, a, it was a, a place of worship. Then it was actually uh, frequently used as a refuge and a shelter um, uh, uh, in the darkest days of, of, of the Second World War. And then it became um, the, the meeting place uh, for the very first meeting um, of, the, of, the, of the General Assembly, almost, um, well, I think, on the 10th of December, if I'm not mistaken, so almost exactly 75 years um, to, to this day. I think the, the, the event itself will be a sort of mixture of of recollection of, of, of where the UN has come since then. But I think, especially in the SG's remarks, it will be very forward-looking. It will be very much uh, about the challenges uh, ahead. Um, I think it will be a sort of interactive event uh, with, with, with some interaction between the Secretary General uh, and Lord, Lord Ahmed, um, the Minister of State for, 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 for the UN, um, of um, the United Kingdom um, and, and youth uh, rep representatives. And uh, the aim will be very much in the spirit that the Secretary General has marked UN75 to, to make this um, a listening and, a, and a, an interaction session in particular um, with those who, who will inherit all the shortcomings of my generation the younger people uh, of, of, of today. It's open to the, to the public. It will, be, it will be on the UN's, um, uh, it will be on UN Web TV, as well as on the UN's Facebook page, and, and hopefully there'll be a good, good uh, participation. Fabrizio, thank you. Fabrizio, thank you very much. Uh, we'll go to Edie Lederer. Edie, go ahead. Um, hi, Fabrizio. Uh, Thank you very much on behalf of the United Nations Correspondents Association for doing this briefing on your findings. Um, I have a couple of questions. Um, in terms of 
the 1.5 million uh, responses, um, regionally, how do they balance out? Did you get a lot more from uh, North America or South America? Is it, was it a real balanced view of the, the world? And um, was it balanced also in terms of people of different economic uh, strata? And you, you just talked about the, uh, these uh, recommendations and conclusions uh, that, that the Secretary General was uh, expected to produce. Um, are they part of the report, or are we still going to uh, see those recommendations come out? And Finally, um, assuming that the uh, general debate in September 2021 will bring world leaders back to the United Nations in person, um, will there be any uh, further um, events related to the 75th anniversary. Thank you. Thank you, Edie. Fabrizio, go ahead. Thank you, Edie, and very, very good to see you. Um, you know, in, in terms of our survey, uh, the, the one that we did directly through, and through our partners and through UN offices, it was really opportunistic in the sense that we had target groups we wanted to reach, above all youth and above all people who the UN didn't hear enough from. Um, but we didn't, we didn't go into any one country saying we need, it has to be strictly representative. Wherever we went, we tried to get as many responses as possible in the hope that by sheer quantity and by outreach to those who are young and whom we don't usually hear, from we would we would get a, a, a roughly representative um, uh, category, and we certainly engaged partners. For example, business partners. Um, we went to gaming companies, um, partners who who we don't usually uh, work with. Um, but there was no pretense, and that's why I'll come back to that of scientific representativity. We did look at countries where we were short and regions where we were short and put more investment of time and effort there to have uh, a balance. And broadly, um, I think we, we, we achieved it. Um, you know, uh, the, I think um, there is, if you, if you turn to page 17 of the report, you'll see the exact breakdown by region um, and by, um, by gender and by age group. And you'll see it's not completely out of sync. Um, with um, distribution of global uh, populations. We did have a very high proportion of respondents from sub-Saharan Africa, from Central and South Asia. Uh, between those two regions, it makes up just over, about 50% of respondents. We had 12% from Europe. We had 11% from Eastern and Southeastern Asia. We had 7% from Latin America. Uh, 6% from Northern Africa and Western Asia, et cetera. I mean, the breakdown is there. It's not totally off kilter um, with, with global population um, distribution. Um, and if anything, it gives a slight over bias um, to, to developing countries and in particular Sub-Saharan um, uh, Africa. But we got responses from all countries and you can see in, in the annexes of the report exactly how many responses we got from each um, each country. By gender, it was we started off having a slight majority of women and girls responding. We finished with a slight majority of men. In terms of youth, we were successful. Fifty plus percent of respondents were under um, thirty. In terms of education levels, um, there, there was a majority of people with post-secondary um, education. So you could argue um, that there's a slight um, skew-whiffing to, 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 to more educated people 
which was unintentional, but it, we ended up that way. But you can also, on, a, on, the, on the platform, break down the findings by education group. So um, we did some of that analysis to see if there were meaningful um, um, differences. And we certainly got a significant response from people who only had primary or, or, or less. Um, in terms of um, recommendations, I mean, the report doesn't make any recommendations, and that was never our objective. Our objective was, was to see what people were worrying about, to see what people hoped for, and to see what people's ideas were without any editorial um, editorializing on our part um, what people's suggestions were for improved multilateralism. And you'll see in our report that based less on the survey and more of the much more in-depth conversations, um, we, um, we, we captured the ideas that came f forward without any censorship um, from these UN 75 conversations, which involved hundreds of thousands of people, and we recorded them without qualifying them, without saying this is a good idea or a bad idea. Our only criteria was to highlight those that were frequently, more frequently repeated and highlight less those that were less frequently um, repeated. So just to come back to representativeness, it has to be said, because we were very aware that our survey was done more opportunistically, which is why we got Pew and Edelman to do very scientifically based surveys that did look at age groups, at education levels, at political persuasions to make sure that we had a reality check against the survey methodology, which was totally scientific. And I have to say, my big concern had been, as we move forward, what were we going to do if we came out with totally opposing results? But the truth is that our results are very, are very, very compatible. So we didn't get it. I mean, our more less scientific approach um, um, uh, you know, was validated by a much more scientific approach. We also got Pew, especially in this last report, to go over the report with a tooth comb. And I should also highlight that this last report was done by an outstanding team at the um, Institute of Higher uh, 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 Studies um, in, in Geneva, which is uh, a very distinguished but very independent academic um, institution. So we've really done our utmost to make this as objective um, and as, as, as intellectually, um, with the largest degree of intellectual integrity possible. In terms of 75 events, I mean, to be honest, I feel quite disappointed that this, we haven't, we've, you know, we had a few events at the beginning of the year, but since then it's all been in this, in this, you know, uh, uh, um, one dimensional Zoom world. Um, and, and the hope had been that at least the event in London which we'd all been looking forward to, would be an in-person event. And it was planned that way up until really quite recently. But uh, COVID and the pandemic thought otherwise. Um, you know, I think that the, the, the president of the General Assembly likes to point out that the 75th session uh, does not finish um, in, in, in January, uh, but goes on until late summer. So um, um, I, 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 I would like to hope that, and I'm sure he would, um, I mean, I, I can't speak for him, but um, I, I, I would hope that, um, you know, in the course of um, the 75th session, the PGA, um, you know, on Charter Day or, 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 or another day might, might find cause um, to, in, to, to, to have something in, in, in person. But my team, and I want to emphasize this, because too often there's the perception that UN entities are born and never die. My team has largely been dismantled, and, and, uh, and it will be completely dismantled by, by, the end of, um, by the end of this month. Great. Thank, thank you, Fabrizio. We'll go to Liling and then James Bays. Thank you. Um, USG Hothschild, thank you for the look ahead. Now, in looking forward, I'd like you to help me please do a bit of t stop taking about lessons learned to take on the future. Um, the past 75 years has seen successes and failures at the UN. You mentioned divisions, including and perhaps especially within the Security Council. 
How have these successes and failures prepared the UN to take on the challenges uh, over the next 25 years? Go ahead, Fabrizio. Yeah, can, can you block the next three hours? <laughs> <laughs> I, I know you could do it um, in a succinct no, manner, Fabrizio. I, think, I trust I, you. You know, I, I, don't, I think others will give you a less biased answer on that. I mean, I've served this organization um, for 30 plus years in, in many different functions and many different duty stations. I, I've seen terrible mistakes made. I served in Bosnia. Um, I left shortly before, but I watched with, with horror um, what happened in, in Srebrenica. Um, I had many colleagues who, 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 to this day, haven't fully recovered from the Rwanda uh, genocide. Uh, I was active in OHCHR um, and involved in many of the very painful internal discussions around what many of us felt was an inadequate response uh, in 2008 to the atrocities unfolding um, in northern Sri Lanka. But what I... There are plenty of episodes in, in the UN's history that I, that I feel deeply uh, ashamed about. But I do feel that as an institution, we have been pretty good at facing up to our own mistakes. And if you look, um, I mean, to many might seem ancient history, but, uh, you know, if you look at the reports that Kofi Annan commissioned on Srebrenica, that were commissioned by the General Assembly, but implemented um, by Kofi Annan on the, um, 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 on the Rwanda genocide, that Ban Ki-moon did on um, um, northern um, Sri Lanka. There was a very earnest attempt uh, to try and learn uh, from those mistakes. So I, I personally believe, and I know uh, that, that there is a strong tendency, and incidentally, this Secretary General is very much part of that, and I've worked closely enough to see that, to be self-critical, to, to, to look, to doubt, not to, to, to have any undue confidence in, 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 in our own role. But having said that, I think the threats we face today um, are, are many of them are exacerbated uh, versions of threats that pre-existed. Um, conflict uh, as taking on different forms, but it, it was at the heart of the intervention of the UN. But many are new threats. I mean, I've been very involved, as some of you may know, with new technologies and digital technologies. Those were not uh, threats. I mean, they, they bring massive um, uh, opportunities. Our ability to talk now is, is an illustration. Imagine, imagine facing COVID without digital technology. Uh, what that would have would have meant, but they also bring massive disruption. They 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 create a whole new um, um, uh, uh, plane for for violence and conflict in a manner that not, has not happened since the invention of of manned uh, flight. Um, uh, so so that wasn't anticipated uh, by our founders. They can um, uh, uh, be used to, to undermine human rights. They can massively boost um, uh, inequality in ways that were not um, uh, uh, contemplated. Um, so, so those are threats that were, were not equipped, were not well equipped to manage. Uh, climate change and destruction to environment were clearly inadequately uh, equipped. Whatever we have is not to scale uh, with the challenge. So I think there's a set of new challenges, and I've just mentioned those two, but there are others um, where, where we need to urgently uh, re, re, reinvent ourselves. And I think that is very much the Secretary General's uh, intention in, in, in the report he'll put forward um, in, in some of this year. We'll go to James and then Celia. James Bays. Secretary General, James Bayes from Al Jazeera. Um, I have a couple of questions for you. Um, the first one is a quick one, um, just on the event on Sunday. Um, the UK has been talking up this anniversary for a long time. The UK Prime Minister mentioned it at Unger. And yet we've got this event on Sunday, which the Secretary General is taking part in, and the UK is represented by Lord Armoured, who, my dealings, is a very pleasant and competent bloke, but... Um, 
if you were to walk, and I'm in London now, the streets of London, no one's ever heard of him. Um, are you not disappointed that a big event like this, that the Prime Minister or the Foreign Secretary is not taking part? I don't, I don't think that anybody, I haven't had anybody uh, frame it uh, at all um, in those terms. I mean, it's, it's a solemn, important occasion. Uh, the UK was absolutely critical in, in the constellation of the United Nations. This is um, a solemn event to mark that. Um, a pandemic, an emergency everybody's dealing with in different ways across the world, which, from what I see in the media, has, has hurt uh, the UK particularly uh, badly, has changed uh, many plans in many different places. So I, 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 I haven't heard those sorts of, of concerns um, expressed. But we're grateful for the, for, the, for the opportunity to mark in a solemn way um, what was the beginning uh, of a, a path that held you and I and most of us um, lead our lifetimes with a large degree of progressive prosperity, and peace, and and I think it's in that spirit that the SG will be will be will be there in London, and it's in that spirit. Um, I mean, also inspired by that, that he will be talking about to to be re-inspired by that example moving forward. And my second question, if I may, um, the whole idea of the 75th was, um, and you've already mentioned it, was to reinvigorate multilateralism. But then COVID got in the way. How much do you think this year, as a result, not of your hard work, but of the pandemic, has been a lost opportunity? And is the UN thinking about maybe four years' time, the 80th? No, I, I mean, I haven't... I, no, I mean, we're more... I mean, we've, in our question, we've been more focused on the 100th, quite frankly, than the 80th. But it, it's... The, look, if, I mean, forgive me for getting a bit historic here, but what's very striking, uh, and uh, if you go back to the origins of the UN, it's you, you, today many people talk about divisions and polarization and, and superpower rivalry making the work of the UN much more difficult, making multilateralism dysfunctional. But if you go back to the origins of the UN, I personally would argue that the superpower rivalry, the divisions within the world, were much greater than they are today. It's very hard to say that um, uh, Stalin and Winston Churchill uh, held more in common than, than the, the, the presidents of, uh, of China and, and, and the US. I think you'd have a very hard case to make. So those divisions have always existed. And I would argue personally that between North and South, East and West, they were arguably worse 70, 75 years ago today. But what is different? What is different? I would argue that against the backdrop of the terrible suffering of the Second World War, next to those divisions, there were universal aspirations, universal aspirations for social progress and social justice through international cooperation, universal aspirations for the better respect for human rights, universal aspirations for development cooperation and international financial cooperation, all of which was first enshrined at the height of the war in the Atlantic Charter and then elaborated upon a few years later in the UN Charter. I would argue, and this is my view, that... that we have lost touch somewhere along the road with those universal aspirations that our grandparents and, to some extent, my generation, because we at least had it indirectly, felt very strongly. And they were moved emotionally, not just intellectually, by the wording of the Charter in ways that my kids, for my kids, it's just a distant uh, historic memory. I think we've lost touch with that. And the aim of our exercise was to go back to We the People and to see if these divisions that we hear every day in the Security Council from the representative of this and that state, if that really reflects all there is out there, or if there's still something, as there was in 1945, next to very real differences 
that we all hold in common. And we have found that there is a great deal that we all hold in common. And that is what the UN needs. It's not to pretend that we all think alike, God forbid. It's to have a sense that next to our differences, we have common interests and common ground that we can share. And let's remember, in very practical terms, that's what allowed the superpowers to negotiate arms control treaties, to, nego to set up agencies to keep nuclear power safe. And despite massive ideological differences and surrogate wars all over the place, to stop the whole of humanity being drawn into a repeat, which would have been even more deadly of, of, a, of a world war as it had been known. So what I hope we've rediscovered and hence have the tools to re-inspire is the common interests that need to be given as much or more play that unite the world as the divisions that seem to command everybody's political efforts and everybody's um, uh, rhetoric uh, disproportionately in ways that are certainly damaging to today's concerns, and we see that in the COVID response, and even more damaging to tomorrow's generations. So, and I think if there's one massive achievement we can learn off the, 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 the founders of the UN is this obsession with doing a better job for succeeding generations than the job that they did for themselves or their parents did for them. And I think we've lost sight on that. I think, I think you know, we're obsessed with ourselves and have forgotten um, succeeding generations. Now, I mean, Steph's going to tell me to shut up and stop extemporizing. So these are very personal opinions, but from somebody who spent a lot of time reading and, and reflecting on this. Thank you. That, that was actually very interesting, uh, Fabrizio. Um, let's go to Celia, then Toby, then Maria. No, it's okay because I got my answer. You got your answer. Yeah. Good. <laughs> okay. Uh, Toby and then Maria. Toby and HK. Yes, thank you very much. And uh, thank you, USG Hawkschild. It's been uh, very illuminating to follow your work over the past year. My question is quite specific, and it, it's about... Um, what you said you could only speculate on, which is perhaps the the most counterintuitive finding of the report, which is that there's sort of a pessimism in the developed world and an optimism uh, in uh, places that are uh, that are less developed and that are even uh, undergoing conflicts at the moment. So wh why is this? That's to me that's one of the most interesting uh, findings uh, of of your work. What, wh how do you process that? Thank you. Go ahead, well, this is my personal um, um, speculation. You know, many, um, many of those who've worked in, in, many of us who've worked in conflict areas or in the poorest parts of the world where, where people have very little, um, are always struck by, by, by the level of generosity on the one hand, hospitality on the other hand. Um, but also on, on, on hope there is, often by those who've, who've lost everything. Um, so, you, you know, you could argue that, that those, those who have virtually nothing um, see, see much greater potential for improvement than, than those who, who, who have everything. Um, so, so I would put that on the one side. On the other side, I would say this. You know, I grew up mostly um, in Europe, so, so in the, the developed world, um, and, and I've been very fortunate um, in, in, in that regard. Um, I've witnessed, uh, at least in the developed world, how, um, you know, and, and I'd ask all of you who are listening to test this assumption on yourselves and, and, and you decide for yourselves whether what I'm saying is, is rubbish or has some reason in it. I believe at least in, in the developed countries, um, mo most of our grandfathers, um, our grandparents, I should say, uh, assumed that the world their kids grew up in, our, our parents, would be slightly better than the world they grew up in, um, that, that there would be greater access to education, to health care, that, that their, their, their children would, would have good job opportunities um, and the, the, the situation was steadily um, improving, as indeed it was, and all statistics bear it out. I believe 
um, most parents of people my generation, maybe not yours, um, most of um, people of my generation, their parents thought that we, their children, would grow up in a world where um, there would be lots of employment opportunities, where, where salaries would rise, where healthcare would get even better, education would be, would be, would be even better, and there was this steady path to constant progress. I, speaking for myself, can't say I think the same for my children. I have severe doubts, and I know many of my peers do too, whether my kids will have the same uh, employment opportunities um, that I was offered um, when, I, when I left um, university. Uh, even in some things like healthcare, um, I mean, in, there are a number of developed countries where the birth, where the, um, the the longevity is actually going down for the first time in a very long time. So I I think in many developed countries, after after decades of progress, there is this sense of insecurity and fear that this sort of constant uh, upward movement that we've taken for granted in terms of salaries, economies, access to healthcare. Is, is not something that we can take for granted for future uh, generations. That, that would be um, my, my sense. And there is certainly a greater sense of uncertainty, or I believe there's a greater sense of uncertainty. So that's my personal speculation. But, but sadly, we didn't have the opportunity to drill down more, but I think it would be interesting. Thank you. Uh, Maria Krinova, Tass. Maria? Uh, thank you, Steph. And thank you uh, very much for this briefing and your personal opinions, especially the most interesting part, I would say. Uh, and uh, I actually have kind of follow up about criticism, uh, which from brief look at the report, uh, I find it that uh, there is not quite enough criticism or there is even no criticism of the United Nations. So. Don't you think it would be useful for the organization, for the suggestions which Secretary General is going to make, to include some questions to the people uh, about what are they dissatisfied with, uh, especially in the work of the United Nations, or why such questions were not included? And also, I have a short follow-up. Uh, you said that there will be a um, more detailed data portal uh, with uh, country-specific information. So can we expect it to be available? When we ex will expect it to be available, sorry. Go, go ahead, Fabrizio. No, I, no, uh, I mean, the point on criticism, f first of all, you know, the endeavor was first and foremost to see what people across the world saw as the chief problems, the UN, um, the, 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 the chief hopes and fears for the world. It, it, there was an element of, of looking at expectations of the UN and seeing how the UN could change uh, for the better. Um, but it, it was in particular, if you, look, you know, where, where the most critical elements come in are in the conversations, in the, 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 the record of the UN 75 conversations, and in the Pew and, and the independent Pew and Edelman surveys, because we thought it, frankly, more suitable uh, for independent survey companies um, like Pew and Edelman um, to ask more critical questions about the UN than if we do so ourselves, and we would inevitably, uh, people wouldn't um, necessarily um, give credence to our, as much credence to our answers than if it came from fully independent entities. So if you look at the Edelman and Pew surveys that have been captured in some form here, but are, but are fully uh, available in all detail on, on, the, on this platform, you will see plenty of areas where people um, believe um, the UN, um, um, uh, where the UN is doing well and where the UN is not doing so well. And I can tell you now, um, you know, and we, we highlighted this in particular in our September report, People like the idea of the UN. At the same time, they see the UN as remote. They, the, the half people don't believe the UN has had a, any impact or, or don't see an impact um, in, in, in their lives. The UN is seen as, as too, too, too many steps 
um, um, removed. Um, the UN is recognized um, for, for having made important contributions around human rights, but there are many other areas where, um, the, where the level of recognition of what we've contributed is certainly not as high as we would like, and certainly not as high uh, than if you'd interviewed uh, UN staff. And I think you will find um, a, a lot of candid criticism um, in that. And then there are many suggestions that the UN is, is, is outmoded in terms of its representativeness and its inclusivity uh, of youth, of, 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 of a more diverse regional representation. Um, of, of the private sector, of, of local authorities. So, so um, I, I think if you dig a bit, you, you will find that we have not shied away um, um, from, from highlighting areas where, where it became very clear that people see we have uh, much room to improve. And on the, the issue of the portal? Yeah. Yes, sorry. The portal, um, I think, went online today. Um, and and it, if it's not in the press package, we'll make sure it gets in the press. The link will be there. I'm not quite sure if all material is yet up on the portal, but a lot of material is up on the portal. So um, so I would I would strongly recommend you go there. And through Steph's office, we'll make sure that yeah. the link uh, is distributed if it hasn't already been distributed. We'll, we'll, we'll make sure. There, there, there was there is a link just. Uh, um, the link to this report, and there is uh, uh, regional uh, regional specific information. But I'm interested if it's possible to see the uh, particular country's answers. Well, c can I suggest you you go to the portal if you don't find what you're looking for. If you come back to my office through me or or through Steph. And I promise you, we'll get you all the criticism you want, and we'll get you the country breakdowns you want. All right. Just Thank you. Let, 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 let me know, Maria, if you have a problem. Okay. I, is that, uh, Errol, are you waving your hands or? No. Okay. So, uh, Fabrizio, I want to thank you very much. Uh, I know you've, you've gone through this twice today, but uh, thank you for your, your answers. And I want to thank all the journalists for their questions. And, um, I think it is Friday today. Yes. So happy Friday. Enjoy the weekend. I think we all deserve it. Take care.